All right, let's talk about um, domestication uh, and this transition from uh, purely hunting and gathering societies into some domesticated and, and sedentism uh, in Africa. So let's look at the continent of Africa and what we know about it. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the uh, agriculture in Africa and the Neolithic Revolution in Africa uh, seems to be a sort of a mixed bag. Um, and one of the reasons why we know so little about it, as we'll look at, is the recent um, uh, events of climate change that have impacted our ability to see things from the past. There's big areas of Africa that are now buried under expanding Sahara Desert, but it wasn't always a desert. And so some of our information has to come from inference from uh, information that we get from big survey projects. Um, I uh, have several good friends who work in places like Libya and uh, Western Africa that look at rock art, that, um, uh, that is to say petroglyphs carved on the side of rocks, um, and they indicate hunting locations, or, or at least the knowledge of animals to hunt, some of which just don't exist there anymore. Uh, these areas are unsustainable. So a lot has changed, and we'll look a little bit at that uh, in a couple minutes. <clears throat> but first, let's look at um, the what changed in Africa. Um, well, it looks like there was uh, the um, there was some domestication of plants, <clears throat> and possibly uh, the domestication of some animals as well in Africa. But <clears throat> its proximity, <coughs> pardon, to uh, the Middle East, as we've seen in the case of Europe. You saw the spread of these uh, farming and herding practices into Europe, uh, and we saw that spread uh, take place after the original uh, foundation in the Middle East. You saw diffusion to Europe. Now, it's possible that some of that diffusion went south as well, because uh, it's about the same distance that we're talking about through Europe as it would be to go through, especially northern Africa. Uh, so. Uh, it, it looks as though some domesticated in, plants and animals, animals may have come from the neighboring uh, Middle Eastern area through either migration or through down the line um, uh, uh, borrowing. The major regions that we know of uh, for domestication in Africa um, of indigenous, uh, pro probable indigenous uh, domestication uh, are the nor northeast of Africa, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea, where uh, teff, finger millet, and of course coffee, the coffee that we drink, was uh, first um, domesticated as a plant species in uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. <clears throat> but the timing for each of these is really poorly understood. We don't have very good fixed dates for when uh, these were developed. In Central Africa, uh, in the Saharan region, it seems as though there's evidence for pearl millet and sorghum being developed uh, in these regions as well. And then in West Africa, uh, we have uh, African rice um, uh, being developed from a wild uh, ancestor species. So <clears throat> in addition to these probable independent inventions of a, a plant domesticates, uh, we also see some uh, plants and uh, then later and, and also some animals uh, brought in from probably the Middle East or uh, borrowed or possibly even migrations of people bringing them. Uh, so wheat, barley and lentils, which we've already seen in the Middle East, uh, starts to make their appearance in uh, Africa as well. <clears throat> also sheep and goats, which were domesticated in the Middle East. Uh, were uh, seem to have penetrated into Africa as well. So these were uh, borrowed species, domesticated species. <clears throat> and then cattle, <clears throat> which is so prevalent in Africa, uh, but <clears throat> there's sort of conflicting information. Uh, some ind uh, evidence indicates, indicates that this was introduced, um, but there's some genetic information that these may, may be um, indigenous 
breeds or strains of cattle that could indicate independent domestication. Or it's possible that these were even, uh, it was a combination of these two. <clears throat> and then of course, like I said, some of the reason why much of this is obscured is because uh, the Sahara is vast. Um, <clears throat> and uh, deserts have, the desert has expanded over a huge area, but it was not always as arid uh, as we have today. It was not always a sand sea uh, as we have today. And climate change between about 14,000 and 4,500 years ago uh, took place that uh, before about 4,500 years ago, there was considerably more rainfall. Um, and so humans could live in these areas that are now really just uninhabitable. Uh, <clears throat> and in the last four to 5,000 years, desertification came through and uh, people just aren't able to live there, but also it makes us difficult to find the sites uh, that uh, existed there, although there is work that's taking place. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons why it's hard to find these sites is because they're small. Um, and you have to really, you have to find it. Um, so surveys, uh, just logistically speaking, how many people are on a team of, of surveyors? Maybe a maximum of 15 people. If you want to cover an area of hundreds of square kilometers in your survey area, you have a, a limited budget, you have a limited number of people, which means you've got to space them out. And uh, if you've got a transect that you're walking that's 20 meters from another uh, person who's walking, you have to make sure that you can see in between your two lines of sight. And uh, if you don't, if it's a very small site, you may miss some of the uh, things that are on the ground. It's also possible that sand is covered in, come, come in and covered these sites. So uh, many small villages of hunter gatherers that probably leave very small signatures, small fingerprints in the landscape uh, are hard to find. The ones that have been found um, in, uh, in Africa, um, the, the small hunter-gatherer sites are similar to Natufian sites in the Middle East. They're small in size, uh, their structure of how they're organized, their range of resources that they're uh, gathering, um, and even things like the grinding stones that we've seen in Natufian sites are very similar, but they're not identical. So these could be similar subsistence strategies to a similar type of environment. <clears throat> the differences are that um, uh, some being somewhat later, it, it appears as though there's pottery and uh, multiple storage uh, pits, which are common in Africa, but, but uh, not really very common in Natufian sites in the Middle East. <clears throat> a couple of sites that uh, uh, we uh, are have some good, some good evidence for this is uh, the Nabta Playa in the Egyptian Western Desert, desert which is situated, situated uh, on a lake <clears throat> which would have been surrounded by grasslands. So a pretty nice place to be. Uh, lakes are, are nice because you have fresh water that you can access, but also animals come there. Um, uh, but this is now completely barren. Uh, in present day. So going there, you would not see this, this grassy landscape and this, this lake. It's just, it's just dry. Um, but the evidence from uh, Nabta Playa showed that there were uh, 15 huts or so. Um, there were pits for storage. Um, there's a, a rare instances of uh, pottery. Um, and uh, there were wild plants and sorghum. Um, also some cattle burials. Uh, and these, those date to about 7,500 years ago, so that 5,500 BC. Another site in Libya uh, is uh, Uan Ufuda, um, which uh, dates to about nine to 8,000 years ago, so um, seven to 6,000 BC. Um, and this has evidence, because it's so arid, there's preservation is good, uh, has things like wood, baskets, charcoal, and seeds. Um, and would show that there were, they had, were using a, a wide range of resources. They weren't just a single economy, uh, a single commodity type of economy. They, ha, uh, they cared for and herded wild Barbary sheep. 
So, uh, um, and this was this is um, uh, indicated by things like uh, dung and plants in the cave as well uh, that that were found. Um, so this is a mixed economy of of behaving uh, with a wide range of resources um, and. Uh, and actually exploiting the local environment, including wild uh, um, uh, husbandry of wild animals. In Western Africa, so moving to the west here, <clears throat> uh, the site of Gobero in Niger, the country of Niger, uh, dates to about 97 to 8200 years ago. Um, it's uh, situated on a lake again as well. Um, with uh, and so, as you might expect, uh, fish bones have been found, but also uh, barbed bone points. Uh, so they were they were exploiting uh, their uh, uh, lake resources as well as um, uh, other resources. You also find the little bladelets, uh, which are typical of Epipaleolithic or um, uh, sort of similar to to uh, these pre. Um, pre-domestic, uh, pre-Neolithic um, economies, but you also, it's been somewhat later than uh, the Middle Eastern uh, examples, but about 77 to uh, 6,200 years ago, you also get pottery. So pottery has been invented here. Um, and you also have a cemetery, uh, which uh, some important information about uh, social clues and that sort of thing can be found. But aridity, again, about 8,000 years ago, brought in uh, um, some uh, an abandonment of the site for a period of time. Uh, but it, then it was re-inhabited. So this place became habitable again um, and uh, 7,200 years ago, so 5,200 BC. And by about 4,000 BC, uh, they introduced cattle. So where it was largely a mixed economy with uh, foraging and gathering resources, uh, fishing, that sort of a thing, um, by about 4,000 years ago, we can see that they were actually um, uh, herding cattle at this site. And so pastoralism is a kind of a consistent theme across Africa, uh, that is to say herding animals. Uh, sh cattle, sheep, and goats um, seem to have been domesticated or being used by hunter-gatherer groups or mobile groups before the domestication of plants occurred. So it seems like integrating the use of animals that you could bring with you uh, and they could graze while you gathered plants, uh, wild plants, was part of the economy. So um, uh, the sites of Nabta Playa, Uan Muhugiag, sorry, uh, Muhugiag, uh, and Gobero, uh, um, 7,500, 7,000, and 6,000 years um, respectively ago. So uh, these um, these communities continued to be mobile. So sedentism, so staying put in one place, uh, don't doesn't seem to have been part of that. Uh, uh, survival strategy, but using docile, uh, genetically modified forms of animals that could, in, uh, that were habituated to humans, was something that seemed to suit them. Um, <clears throat> now, moving into uh, uh, the farming communities, uh, most of our evidence comes from uh, places like um, uh, the north of Africa. So Egypt, about 7,000 years ago, it's poorly understood. We don't understand this, um, this shift into uh, farming communities. We're gonna talk a little bit more about Egypt in a later chapter though, but um, the uh, domestication of plants seem to have been backup resources when wild resources failed due to things like floods in the Nile Valley, that happens uh, um, frequently, or drought. So if you had occasional disasters, you could hedge against that by having some cultivated plants. Um, and this allowed for uh, larger uh, villages to be established. And of course, this is the sort of foothold you want 
uh, if you want to um, uh, look at communities that expanded into, of course, the great states of of, uh, of Africa, including that of Egypt, which we'll uh, look at more, more carefully later on. Um, and it looks as though there was also indigenous uh, domestication of plants. Uh, so, for instance, millet grains about uh, 3,500 years ago at Darchit uh, in um, Western Africa. And slightly later, uh, sorghum seems to have uh, been grown as well. So that's the evidence that we have for Africa. And so I'll end it here and pick it up with the next region.